Hey, welcome everybody. So it's the summer. I'm having problems with my microphones. And so what I think I'm going to do right now, if I, I can't do that, I wanted to bring up the uh, microphone level indicator, but I can't do that. So hopefully uh, you hear me clearly and you hear me well. So this is the construct validity video uh, part number one. And just to put this in the context, especially for the research method students, uh, there are several things that make an experiment valid. The first one is construct validity, uh, which is pretty foundational. It's whether or not your measurements uh, are working properly. And so again, construct validity, how well you operationally define the hypothetical constructs in your experiment. So what this basically means is the operational definitions are well chosen, they make sense, they're very specific and very uh, concrete, uh, and then they work as expected. So we have two sets of constructs that are going to be operationalized in an experiment. One set is the independent variable constructs, and the other are the dependent variable constructs. And so when you're looking at the IV constructs, usually these are going to not be measured, but they're going to be manipulated. And so what you're doing is you're creating some type of uh, procedure to create this construct. And so one way you want to make sure that the independent variables are working as expected is to do what we call a manipulation check. So in my experiments, I manipulate the intention of someone to do somebody else harm. And I do that by describing different behaviors that the person does. And that's the way I create a manipulation. That is, one group gets a description of somebody acting very intentional. The other group gets a description of somebody uh, acting negligent. Uh, that's my independent variable. And so later on in the experiment, I ask them about that manipulation. I say, did Bob do this or do that? Did he act this way or that way? And hopefully, the subjects would remember or be able to recognize how the person in the description acted. And that would be a manipulation check in that the subjects actually noticed the manipulation. And so I know that they knew what the manipulation was, so it would be affecting them in some way. Another way we can uh, you know, uh, check to see if the independent variable manipulation works is a pilot study. And a pilot study is a small study before you do the major experiment to see if different parts are working. And so what you do is you basically give people the manipulation and then just give them the manipulation check without the dependent variable. Or the easiest way is to use pre-existing independent variables. Uh, independent variables that other researchers have used are examples of this. And so again, always look at other studies uh, and steal or uh, borrow their manipulations. So when we're talking about dependent measures, uh, and usually these are measurements or tests or ratings, we're uh, now talking about something very specific in terms of construct validity which is validity and reliability. And now we get to a big problem with uh, the problems with these surveys or these tests or measures. Those terms are interchangeable, uh, which is, you know, again and again, when I see students trying to do experiments, they make up surveys. That is, they literally just sit down and say, okay, I want to ask people about eating disorders, so what questions should I ask them? And they, they write down a set of questions. Uh, this is problematic because we have no information about how well those questions are measuring the operation, the, con the construct in, that we have in mind. Those questions are the operational definitions and we don't know if these questions about eating disorders actually properly measure the construct which is actually having an eating disorder. And so as I like to say, and let me pull out my laser pointer, if you're going to use a test without reliability and validity information, you're going to have a bad time. That is, if you don't have this reliability and uh, validity information for your test, 
you don't have a good measurement. And without measuring something appropriately, that's the foundation of your experiment is gone. And so what's really important is knowing what the psychometric properties of your test are. Uh, that is mainly the reliability and the validity. And so that's what the rest of this lecture in part number two is going to be covering, these issues of psychometrics. Now, first off, you don't have to worry about it uh, that much. Uh, let's say that you want to do a survey on eating disorders. Well, you can go to these books here, and you can look up pre-existing scales on eating disorders or, psychological, or social psychological attitudes or marketing scales or whatever. Uh, the library is full of these books. So it's very easy to find pre-existing scales, so you don't have to make something up yourself. Or you can go to uh, the library's webpage, and just below Psych Info is something called Psych Tests, and that's just a database of psychological tests. So then again, you don't have to make up a test yourself. You can use a pre-existing test. Uh, popular tests, the Beck Depression Inventory, Rorschach's test, uh, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, uh, all of these are surveys that are popularly used, uh, and they are used because they generally work. There's Hermann Rorschach, the uh, famous uh, developer of the Rorschach test. Uh, people would say, well, shouldn't you just like put one of the ink blocks, blots? No, because those are licensed. You know, according to his test, people shouldn't see the ink plots until they actually take the test. And so anytime I see a real Rorschach ink blot uh, in a TV show or a movie or a magazine, I say that's bad because you're ruining uh, the uh, you know, validity of the experiment, of the measurement. But let's say that you don't have a pre-existing scale or you know, you may be asking yourself, well, why are these scales that pre-exist, why are they better than something I could make up? And the answer is because they have been, uh, you know, assessed to their psychometric qualities, and those qualities, the two important ones, are validity and reliability. And so the first one is validity. Validity, uh, you know, means that the test is measuring what it was designed to measure. And that's the best definition of validity I can think of. Uh, you know, the test measures what it was designed to measure. If I wanted to measure, uh, you know, likelihood that someone would develop an eating disorder, then the test would measure the likelihood that somebody would develop an eating disorder. And other people look at other ways to talk about construct validity, but the easiest for me and again, probably the most important for me because it comes down to actually the numbers you can look at, it's the idea of construct validity. Uh, and that's the idea of whether or not the test correlates well with similar tests and whether the test correlates poorly with dissimilar tests. So let's take a look at what we're talking about. When we want to use this construct validity approach, we use what's called a multi-method, multi-trait approach. And the way it works, as the name implies, is that you have two different traits, multi-traits, and then two different methods, multi-methods. So, for example, uh, let's say that uh, we are going to look at the two different traits of masculinity and femininity, and we're going to use two different methods, the BEM sex role inventory and the EPAQ. Uh, that's how we go about doing it. And when we're doing this approach, what we would like to see to give us evidence that we have good construct validity and good reliability, uh, I mean good validity, excuse me, is that uh, in the cell for the same trait with the same method, we would have the highest R correlation that we would see, and that's just simple reliability. However, when we have different traits using the same method, we call that discriminant or differential validity. That should be the second lowest correlation in this whole matrix. When we have different methods but the same trait, 
that's convergent validity, and that should be the second highest correlation next to reliability. And just as long as the conver convergent validity is higher than the discriminant validity, we have good evidence that we have a valid test. The larger the difference, uh, the uh, uh, more evidence for validity. And then down here in the last cell should be the lowest R. Uh, I like to, you know, most people don't talk about it. I give it the name silly discriminant validity because it actually just doesn't make sense. It's silly. So let's take a look at some actual data. Let's say that we're interested in validating uh, the masculinity scale of the BEM sex role inventory. So using the multi-method, multi-trait approach, what we do is we uh, give people uh, you know, a test of the same trait, uh, you know, and we use the same test, and then we use different tests. And so a different test that measures masculinity is the EPAQM. And then also, we want to use different traits. And a different trait uh, would be uh, femininity. And so here with discriminant validity, we're going to correlate uh, the uh, masculinity scale of the BEM sexual inventory with the femininity scale of the BEM sexual inventory. Here in the convergent validity uh, cell, we're going to correlate uh, the masculine score for the BEM sexual inventory with the masculinity score of the EPAQ. This will give us a measure of convergent validity. And in fact, when you do that, what you see is you get a correlation of 0.72. And you can this is a Pearson correlation, so you can interpret that normally, which means that's a very large correlation in psychology. And discriminant validity correlating the BSRI's measure of masculinity and femininity, different concepts, different traits measured by the same method, the BSRI, we have a very low correlation, 0.14. And again, because the convergent validity is higher, in this case much higher than discriminant validity, uh, we have evidence that this is a good valid construct. And also out here pops something else. Notice we're correlating uh, the scores with themselves. That may sound odd. That is reliability. And that's what's going to be in the part two of this lecture series.